Let's all be seated. And before we start, um, let's commit our message to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks that we can gather and open your word and we pray this evening that your eternal truths from your word touch our hearts, Heavenly Father, only through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you speak to us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, I've been doing a series on prayer and I had um, sort of the next sermon, work, I was working on it and something took my attention from the Word of God which is related to prayer but not directly and I wasn't planning to speak from this passage but I will because it spoke um, it spoke to me and I'm sure it speaks to all of us. It's a well-known passage. Um, it's in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, and verses 38 to 42. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 38 through to 42. It's the story of Mary and Martha or Martha and Mary. I read from verse 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and... Sorry? Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Yeah. I think that's what I said. My apologies. I'm showing my age. Chapter 10 and verse 38. My apologies. I'll start from the beginning. Now, it happened as they went, he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet, and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. So the story is quite, um, quite simple, um, but it, it speaks of some profound truths as we unpack it. And I speak at conferences and there's one speaker who always asks questions and if you get the question right he gives out prizes now I don't have any prizes or anything like that but I'm going to ask how many Marys are there in the New Testament anybody got any idea and if it makes you feel better I wasn't sure and I had to look it up because I wanted to make sure which Mary I was dealing with how many Marys are there in the New Testament any idea pick a number three no it's not three Four? No, it's not four. Okay, it's six. I'll just go through them. Mary, mother of Jesus. Mary Magdalene. Mary of Bethany. Now, Mary of Bethany is the one we're speaking about this evening. Mary, the wife of Clopas or Alpheus. Mary, the mother of John Mark in Acts. And there's a reference to a Mary at the Church of Rome in Romans chapter 16. They are the three, they're the six Marys we find in the New Testament. 
And Mary it was a very common name um, from the Hebrew name Miriam. So that's why we've got so many and we've just got to make sure we're dealing with the right one. Mary of Bethany um, was Lazarus's and Martha's sister. And she was the one who anointed Christ with the very expensive... Um, oil prior to his um, uh, death and and burial, and that's when you know the, the apostles. I think it was Judas who said, you know, all this money that's been spent, it could have been given to the poor. And Christ said, look, you've always got the poor with you. What she's done has been for my burial, and it will be recounted, you know, forever, so to speak, about what she's done for me. So what do we understand about this Mary and Martha? Well, they lived in Bethany, and Bethany was a town right outside Jerusalem. We would probably call it a suburb of the CBD of Jerusalem. So it was very close. It appears that um, they may have been a wealthy family. It says here that um, Martha welcomed him into her house. It was her house. Um, and we also understand that Christ, um, from other passages, loved Lazarus, resurrected him from the dead, was close to this family. And he's coming into Jerusalem, and it says, as it happened, they went, and he entered a certain village, and Martha welcomed him into her house. And Martha was very busy. It says in our passage that she was distracted with much serving. She was very active. Perhaps her character, because when we read the story of Lazarus being resurrected and Jesus coming to, to, to the town there, Martha was the one that ran out to meet Jesus. Mary was at home weeping. And Martha says, you know, the master's calling you. And then Mary went to speak with Jesus. So it seems that we're dealing with somebody who's relatively dynamic, forthright, um, and she was serving, and that was important in that time and for that culture that, you know, people serve and guests are made to feel welcome. Um, we read it in, in the New Testament and the Old Testament. You know, when somebody went into a town square, they weren't left alone. They were brought in. Somebody had to look after them. Hospitality was very important, very much like ourselves, those from a Greek background, you can just, um, you know what I'm talking about on Sundays when you were invited to somebody's house when you were young, um, the hospitality was way over the top, there was a lot of food and stuff like that and interestingly when we set up the Bible studies and the home groups, we made a point, you know, let's not focus on the food and trying to outdo each other with how much food and hospitality we're, we're, we're showing, the important thing is focusing on the word of God. So Martha was distracted with much serving, whereas Mary sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. This is a complete contrast between the two of them. Not necessarily that Martha was doing anything bad, but her actions and perhaps attitude were completely different to Mary. Martha was involved in much serving, distracted by it, was in the presence of Jesus Christ and perhaps wasn't hearing what he was saying and, Jesus, and Mary sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And, Mary at, uh, and Martha at some point says, look, this has got to stop. I'm doing all this stuff 
and Mary's doing nothing but just sitting there and listening. And she goes up to Christ and says, Don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. Christ obviously did care about Martha. In the words that you read, the, 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 the duplication of her, her name, Martha, Martha, reminiscent of you know when Christ was speaking to Simon Peter Simon Simon it's almost a term of you know um, of concern yes I am concerned you about you Martha and what does Christ say to her about what she's going through or what's happening at that time you are worried and troubled those two words worried the Greek word is more accurately translated as anxious. You're troubled. Um, the Greek word there is, it's interesting, it's like you're, there's turbulence in your life. There's a lot going on and you're agitated and it's turbulent and that's, the, the, the Latin um, picks up that Greek word um, and that's where we get our word turbulent. So you, you're anxious, you're turbulent, you're troubled about all... And what are you troubled about? Many things. Many things. And Christ says, one thing is needed. You're troubled about many things... In contrast, Mary, who's sitting and listening to Jesus Christ, she has chosen that good part, which can't be taken away from her, and that's equated with one thing that you need. So this contrast between the two sisters is really important to, 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 to unpack and what it might mean for us today. Often this passage is treated at a, and I'm not saying I'm going into it deeply, but you know, at a superficial level, you know, we should choose Christ and what, what Christ says over all other things. And that's true, but what does it actually mean for us today? And the reason why I spoke about this, this particular passage is it, it spoke to me personally and, and I'll just share you know my some of my personal experiences so as of well recently or earlier this year I I hit the the big 60 and when you turn 60 and if you work the required number of hours you get a seniors card so I've got a seniors card I'm considered a senior person now I think some of you might have seen his cards. Um, and through my work and a lot of the contacts I've had over the years, a lot of the people are approaching my age, or a little bit older, a little bit younger. And one of the common themes when they are taught, when you talk, is, oh, you know, we've had enough of work. Um, we need time to do the things that we want to do. And I'm seeing people like travelling. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with travel, but it's almost like they've got this list of things that they have to do. They have to travel. So they start, you know, we, we, we don't want to wait till we're too old and we can't do it. They start travelling. This year we're going to go here or twice a year they'll go overseas and they've got a bucket list of all the places that they want to go to. And then there's the whole idea of, you know, Security, you know, having money to be able to do these things and not to have to worry about, you know, finances. You're at that stage in life when that's what, you know, you should be doing. And, you know, not everybody has perfect finances or perfect abilities. I mean, it's, it's almost like um, there's only not many, there's not many people that might be able to achieve this. A lot of people struggle a lot more. But you see this pressure of you know, wanting to experience, wanting to do, and you're challenged by many things. There are many things that seek to draw your attention 
and to suck up your time. And this is because there's a number of things that have come together, particularly in our society, in our age, at our time, that weren't prevalent in the past. My father's generation, like many of your fathers and mothers who came to Australia from um, overseas, war-torn Europe, they grew up in primarily an agrarian society. So you worked, you slept, you worked, you slept, and you hear them talk, you know, there was the Sunday when you know, maybe there was something that they'd all go to church, and the annual panigiri or the, the fair that they had, and there might have been some weddings and a few things like that. But, you know, they, they didn't have television. We grew up with television and now you walk around with a, you know, a, a powerful computer in your pocket, which exposes us to so many things. And that exposure might be in technical terms might be explained as pluralism and in its technical sense more than one ultimate principle and in a hugely pluralistic society the choice grows exponentially we have choices for so many things Think about it, there's people that devote their time and life, I'll just pick some examples, model railways. Creating a model railway of some idyllic scene on some theme and they know the intricacies and the ins and outs of everything. And it's considered a good thing, that's his love, that's his passion. Follow your love, follow your passion. And if you're an inquisitive sort of person, interested in a lot of things, and I tend to fall into that category, um, then, you're, then you have all these things attacking you and trying to draw your attention. And I've already decided that there's books that I want to read that I'm probably never going to get to because there's just so many of them. And we all face that problem. If we start talking about what some of our interests might be, you might find this diversity of interests, potentially. You might find people have more than one interest over and above work, because we live in a society where, you know, the, it, the view is, okay, we want to work less, have more leisure. And the fact is, to have more leisure, we need more money, so we have to work hard. So there's this vicious cycle that just goes around. So we're consumed by work as a society. We're consumed by the things that we want to achieve, the things that we want to enjoy. We're anxious about all these things. It creates turmoil in our lives. How are we going to get there? How are we going to do this? How are we going to have the perfect holiday? And when things don't work out, wow, you know, it's almost like catastrophe. First world problem, I understand, but that's how society works today in a lot of ways. The, the whole concept of consumerism where, you know, giving people multiple choices to be able to spend money. And there's a whole, you know, industry around using marketing and subliminal marketing to be able to get you to spend money buying their products. And we might put this into the category of desires that keep attacking us and tempting us, as distinct from the basic necessities of life. And Christ says something very interesting here to Martha. You are troubled about many things and he's saying essentially none of these things matter only one thing is needed only one thing 
this many things that you're involved in and are troubling you are not what you really need. Only one thing's needed. And bring it back to ourselves, I guess, and the society we live in. The Apostle John in 1 John um, in the second chapter, we know the, we know the per verses very well. Do not love the world or the things in the world, the lust of the eyes, the pride of the, 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 the desires of the flesh, the, the, the desires of the eyes um, and the pride of life. And it says, don't love these things. And then in verse 17, he explains why, 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, why we are not to love these things or why we are not to be troubled by many things in the context of what we're, what we're talking about here. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Everything that draws our attention, seeks our allegiance, wants our time, let's understand it's passing, it's going, it's fleeting. It will be consumed in fire using you know, the end of time ap apocalyptic language. It's all passing. Only he who does the will of God abides forever. Now, before I speak about the one thing that's needed, this passage also speaks to us as Christians. We can fall into the trap of being very active and busy as Christians in terms of service, being involved, doing things, activities, programs, causes, all there to draw our attention. We should be doing this, we should be doing that. And a lot of that is action and activity. But is it the one thing that's needed? And more importantly, does it stem from the one thing that's needed? Because obviously I'm not going to say going to church is one of too many things or being involved in church or running programs and activities or supporting causes or being involved in all sorts of things that often Christians are involved in in this day and age. I'm not going to say that those things are not good, but if they are the end of what we want and what we want to achieve, and it's really just another way of replacing a lot of activity with other, from other worldly things to activity in Christian things, is that the one thing that's needed? And do those things stem or begin from the one thing that's needed? And what's the one thing that's needed that we see in this passage? It says that Mary sat at, at Jesus' feet and heard his word. That's all it says. She sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And Christ says, this is the one thing that's needed. And it's the one thing that remains in eternity and it's the only thing that matters. 
hearing Christ's word. We obviously don't have Jesus Christ here today speaking to us directly as Mary did and for her and in the in that context where she was these people were waiting for a Messiah these people understood the promises that were given to Israel they understood that the, there was a kingdom that was promised they had not had that kingdom for so long we know the destruction of Jerusalem um, by the Babylonians. We know the, 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 the splitting of the tribes, the ten northern tribes, the two southern tribes. And we know that for 400 years, there hadn't been any prophets. And the, I think it was the Jewish rabbis had coined the phrase that for that 400 years, God hadn't spoken, all they had were echoes of God. And particularly in the 150 years before Christ, there was revolts, messiahs who claimed to be messiahs that were going to overthrow the Romans, and every time they were crushed. And so this nation, this people, were looking for the Messiah. And Jesus came onto the scene and he was completely different to everybody else. A different message, a different word. And it's not surprising that so many people sat and listened. And surely a lot of people rejected but from that we see the blossoming and the growing of the Christian church. So she sat at his feet and heard his word. What does that look like today to hear Christ's voice and Christ's word? On a very simplistic level, we would say that it's all contained here. And we read it and we hear it and see it. And it's true. We have the Word of God, the Bible, which prior generations haven't had. We have it in so many translations. It's the one book that has been studied more than anything else you can have computer software and i use some of that software and i'm sure you use it if i want to know how many times a word's you've been used in the new testament you can find it and you can find it in whichever in greek or whatever you want or trace um, words through the bible it, it's 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 been studied but to hear christ's word today involves something more than that. It means communing with Christ. As Paul says, being in Christ. And this is the only thing that matters. Nothing else matters other than being in Christ and being able to hear Christ speak to my heart and to speak to your heart. It's more than just reading the word and rotely understanding what Christ says. Because Christ came in human form as a relational being, and God's always been a relational being, wanting relationship with us. And to hear... Christ and his word means to live in Christ. 
And how does God speak to us today? I'm always wary, and I'm sure all, all of you are wary when you hear somebody get up in the name of God as a preacher saying something like, God spoke to me and said, if I don't raise X million dollars for this ministry, I'm going to die. And so therefore the guilt trip is put on the congregation and they're told to be part of God's plan and give a lot of money so this ministry can happen and this person doesn't die. I'm really hesitant and I can probably say I'm pretty sure God didn't speak to that person in that way. And we've got all these examples of, you know, God couldn't have spoken and said those things. And one of the ways we know is testing it with the word of God. If the word of God says one thing, God's not going to reveal to me something different. So, for example, God will not... God says that a man should have one wife till death do us part. God is not going to reveal to me that I am going to be better off emotionally and my wife's going to be better off emotionally if we separate and marry other people. It ain't going to happen because it doesn't, doesn't tie in with God's eternal truths as revealed in Scripture. But God does speak to us individually and we've experienced that. And God speaks to us because of when we say we're in Christ, we speak of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is experience. This is not the thing of, you know, proofs and, um, and, and analysis. This is the personal experience we have. What does Christ say in John chapter 14 and verse 17? If you open to John chapter 14 and verse 17... The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. This is personality. This is the, the, the Holy Spirit, a personal being, the third member of the Trinity dwelling in us. And a little bit further, at verse 26, it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So, it's the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. It's the Holy Spirit called here the Helper, sent by the Father in Christ's name, who will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So the words of Christ become alive, in the case of the, the disciples here, when Christ left, it was the Holy Spirit that was going to bring to their remembrance everything that Christ said to them. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to bring to our remembrance all the things that we read and study in the Word of God and the things that we hear at church and the things that we hear in our community. And that becomes the personal relationship and prayer, which we've spoken about earlier in one of the earliest sessions, which is essentially talking to God and listening to God. Prayer is central to this hearing 
God's word or hearing Christ's word. Prayer is central. It's the mean or it's the it's the means of communication with God. The word can only be understood and transformative when it's read prayerfully. When we read the word of God and in and we pray over it so it becomes a reality in our lives. And we've given some examples of that in the past and Perhaps I'll do another session on that or another sermon on that. And when that becomes the reality in our lives through prayer, Christ's words are heard. The relationship blossoms and develops. And it's the only one thing that's needed. We don't need anything else now you're going to tell me George we need we need to eat and we need clothes and we need a roof over our head yeah on one level we do because they are the basic essentials of life despite the fact that that's been sort of perverted in a lot of ways so we have to have the biggest house, the best house, the best of everything, the best food, the best of everything. But yeah, there, there are some basic essentials in life that we need. But Christ is only one thing's needed, and that's the relationship with Christ. And the reality is, that's the only thing that stands the test of time, the test of eternity. Because Christians have gone without food, Christians have gone without shelter. Christians have paid with their lives. And they still do in, in other countries where, you know, professing Christianity means a death sentence. And people are prepared to give up all of that because there's only one thing that really matters. It's the word of Christ and what stands in eternity. And that's only cultivated through our personal relationship, our personal communication with God. And that then leads to our activity and what we should and shouldn't do. It's not the other way around. And it's really important, it, it's been a lesson to me, just thinking through this passage, about all the competing things that come to me for my time. I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Important things, I've got to do, there's things that you know, I'm called to do in church, and I'm not saying I, you know, I'm, I'm doing them under compulsion. They, they're the things that I, I want to do and I, and, and I feel that I should do. But then on top of that, there's other things, and then the world comes in and says, hey, you're 60, you know, when are you going to travel? When are you going to do this? When are you going to do that? And it brings about all this turmoil in our minds. You know, have I missed out? What should I be doing or shouldn't be doing? Have I put enough money away? And so on and so on. You know the, you know the, you know the, 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 the issues. Christ says... To me and he says to you look there are many things that you can be worried and troubled about but the only the real rea the, the reality is only one thing is needed so not even one thing is to your benefit Christ saying this is George he's saying to me this is the only thing you need if you've got this, you've got everything. Everything else will fall in its place. Family, work, whatever you need to do. But the one thing that's needed is to hear me in your life. Through my word, through prayer, and through communion with other brothers and sisters. May God bless his word in our hearts this evening. We'll finish with...
um, our final song and then we'll have our prayer session. Let's all stand. And before we um, have our song, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks that your word is so clear. We pray that you help us all understand deeply the one thing that we need. To hear you and to hear Christ speak to us through the word, through prayer, through meditation on your word, through surrender to you. As individuals, as families and as a church, Heavenly Father, let that be our guiding principle. We truly give thanks for all you provide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>